circle will not be meeting Tuesday morning, but we'll meet on the 21st. Okay. Mary Farmer Circle. Mary Farmer Circle. Uh, good morning. Good morning. We could do that one more time. I know it's a little gloomy outside, but isn't it still a good morning to worship our Lord? So one more time. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Amen. Woo! We got a great crowd in the back too as well. Uh, but good morning. Um, it is really good to see all of you. This I know it's a little bit gloomy today but still a wonderful Sunday that we get to worship. Amen? Amen. And isn't it such a good morning that I know last week we didn't have our six foot seven preacher going around saying hi to everyone. So isn't it great that he's back as well? Right? Right? So praise the Lord. That's why we gave him a little extra time to go around and just saying hi to everyone to start. But, oh, it looks like we have a special. Oh, yes. Um, I'll be sharing this announcement in a bit. Um, but it's really good to once again uh, see all of you and for you to be here as we worship, and especially as we're going, continuing our summer season. And so as we begin, I just thought I'd just share with you first a scripture from Ephesians chapter 2. And I, I want to share this scripture because last week we talked about the Holy Spirit. We talked about Pentecost. And, you know, just because Pentecost is done, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is gone or missing, right? Like, we taught and we, we believe that the Holy Spirit is with us each day and forever. And so this is what the Holy Spirit reminds us. Ephesians chapter 2. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus, himself as the chief cornerstone. Amen. Right, we're reminded that the Holy Spirit gives us this amazing gift that we are no longer strangers, but we are brothers and sisters, right? Children of the kingdom of God. And we are reminded as well of the good news that is in us, Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And so just because Pentecost is over, doesn't mean we, you know, just move forward, but we are reminded of the Holy Spirit that is in us every day. And today, Pastor Don will just share with us more about the fruits of the Spirit. And so we are excited for that. And so I have the honor of just sharing with us our announcements for today. Um, you can find all of the announcements in our bulletin, but let me just highlight first a couple of important ones. You'll see in our slides, the first one that we have today is that the Senior Council is doing a dinner this week on Wednesday, June 15th at 6 p.m., right? And the Senior Council is running a potato bar, right? I was sharing with our 8.30 worship uh, today that I first learned about a potato bar when I first moved to Richmond. So it's very new to me, but it sounds so amazing, isn't it? Butter, right? Sour cream, cheese, nothing vegetables, I realized. Right. Oh, I guess potato is a vegetable, quote unquote. Right. And then bacon bits. Oh my lord, who loves bacon bits here? Right. That's pretty much like everyone here. So the senior council is doing a wonderful dinner this Wednesday. It's going to be a potato bar um, at Wednesday, June fifteenth at six p.m. And so please sign up at the book at the information center, or just let any of us know if you plan to join us. Our next announcement is VBS. Uh, VBS. I'm gonna remind us each week of wonderful VBS that is happening on August 3rd through the 6th, and registration is open. So you could tell your friends, you could tell your families, tell your children or your friends of children that, you know, you could, they could go on BeulahUMC.org, and there's going to be a big banner that says Vacation Bible School, and there's a button for register now. And if you're all curious about the schedule, you could tell them that they could find the schedule as well online. But generally, from August 3rd through the 6th, it's from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. And so uh, that's the Vacation Bible School. But also, I want to share with us that what, we, what we're planning to do for Vacation Bible School is on Saturday the 6th, because the theme is food truck party and how God gives us our daily bread, not just physically, but also spiritually, 
uh, one of the ideas that we have is in tangent with a yard sale that is happening on that day, we're going to invite a couple of food trucks to come into our parking lot and to do like a live food truck party and open it up to the whole community and so, so that we could make some connections with our community, but also show our students that, you know, this is the food truck party coming alive, not just learning it in VBS, but physically seeing it. And so it, it's super exciting. And so please put that in your calendars if you're planning to help us out. If you're going to be a volunteer, please sign up as well so that I know that you're in the system as well. And so that's VBS August 3rd through 6th. And if you have any questions, let me know or Ms. Karen Klein in the back as, uh, know as well. And then our last announcement um, for, that's on the screen is annual conferences this week from uh, June 16th through the 18th. And so that's uh, Thursday through Saturday. And so please keep the pastors and lay leaders in your prayers as we travel and just do the business of the United Methodist Church in the Virginia Conference. And so we're excited for that. So please keep us in our prayers as we go to that, and we'll be right back. And so that's annual conference happening uh, this week. And just one last announcement is that the Mary Farmer Circle is not meeting this Tuesday. So if you're part of that circle, just an announcement that we're not, they're not meeting this Tuesday, but instead they're going to meet on the 21st at 11 for a lunch on. So that's uh, just a special announcement for those part of that circle. So with that said, um, before we move into our call to worship, we're just going to invite Pastor Don um, for a special announcement as we move forward. Good morning, church. How good it is to see you all this morning, and I pray that you've had a wonderful week. I want to thank God for all the ways that I've seen in you the faithfulness of God, your telephone calls and cards and text and uh, some meals dropped by our house to help support our family. Um, unfortunately, I became sick first, and so did Christy, who followed me. And you all know that when uh, things aren't good with Mama, things aren't good. So when Mama's down, the whole house is down. So thank you all for your prayers, and uh, we are all feeling much better. This morning, we want to recognize uh, someone special among us. Zachary, I'm going to have you come forward. Uh, many of you may know today is Zach's last Sunday among us as our director of music. Uh, back at the end of March, uh, Zach approached me um, and asked me to be in prayer with him. And he and Kathleen, as they were deciding what their future might look like, he had an opportunity uh, to apply for a job in Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas, uh, working at a community college there in the music department. Uh, so I prayed with Zach. We had conversation. Uh, he flew out and interviewed, and then he met with me again and asked me for my advice and wisdom on the decision he should make. Uh, so he pursued uh, three or four people who offered him uh, wisdom and how to move forward. And so we congratulate Zach. He did, in fact, uh, receive an offer for that job and accepted that job. So he and Kathleen are moving to Kansas. Uh, and so we want to thank him for his ministry among us. And uh, we have a card and a gift for Zach and Kathleen. Uh, and so we're going to have a prayer of blessing over Zachary uh, and thank God for he and Kathleen as they move forward. Uh, every part of our lives are interconnected at some point or another. We cross each other's paths and bless each other. And, and when God op offers, offers an opportunity to open a new door to move on, we also thank God for that and send off our uh, friends in Christ in that direction. So we want to thank God today for this new opportunity for Zach. I want to present you with this, Zach. And we're going to ask God to bless Zach and Kathleen as they head out. Uh, to Kansas. How many, anybody know, ever, anybody ever been to Kansas before? Yeah. I have a couple of uh, Kansas fans out there, but so we, you know spe specifically how to pray for Zach and Kathleen as they head to Kansas. So let's give God thanks for his ministry among us uh, and uh, send him off with a farewell blessing. At the end of the service, Zach will be out there in the narthex and you can thank him yourself and uh, give him warm wishes and prayers as well. Let's pray for Zach and Kathleen. God, we do want to thank you for the joy that is ours in sharing together in kingdom work. We thank you that, God, you invite us to stand shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, elbow to elbow, to work together for the building of your kingdom. And God, specifically, you have gifted us individually with gifts to increase that work. We thank you for the gifts that we have seen in the life of 
uh, Zach and Kathleen Lord they make an incredible team and we thank you for the ways that he has blessed and led us in worship of you so we thank you now for the opportunity the door that you are opening uh, new provision of space and time and uh, opportunity uh, for work God we pray that you would bless bless them as they go from this place we pray for safety in their travels Lord we pray for health we pray that as they arrive in Kansas that they would find a community to belong in and belong with and connect to Lord from worship to friendship uh, God we thank you that you uh, are providing for them this opportunity so we send him out now in appreciation and love and in gratitude and we ask your blessing upon him in Christ's name and the church says Amen. Let's give God a hand this morning for Zach and his ministry. God bless you, Zach. Thank you. Thank you, church. I would invite you with that same excitement that led you to clap and appreciation to stand as you are able for our call to worship. It is raining outside, and aren't we thankful that we are under shelter to worship the Lord this morning? We're not in a brush arbor. Thanks be to God. God's provided more than a brush arbor for us this morning, though it's a part of our rich history. We stand in the presence of God, covered under shelter this morning, hearts prepared to worship. I invite you to join me in our call to worship. I will lead you as your leader. You, the people responding, the words are there on your screen to your left and right. And then we're going to lift our voice in song. All I need is you, Jesus. All I need is you. Let's be called to official worship this morning. From the very whisper of creation, God poured forth love. Praise be to God for the blessings of God's love. In the fullness of time, God sent Jesus as a revelation of God's own self. Praise be to Jesus for the many ways in which he revealed God to us. When we thought all hope was lost, God offered the Holy Spirit to heal us and guide us. Praise be to the Holy Spirit for guidance and inspiration. All blessing and honor and power and majesty to God forevermore. Amen. How many of you can say this morning that at some point in your life, maybe even this week, you felt like all hope was lost? Anybody ever been there before? Yeah? If I'm honest with you this morning as your pastor, I should do this. Right? Right? I've been there. All hope felt lost. And then we say, but when I think all hope is lost, God, I remember your faithfulness. In the person of Jesus Christ, you're faithful. In the power of the Holy Spirit, you're faithful. In your healing and your guiding, God, you're faithful. And so we stand before you this morning knowing that ours is the hope. The hope that is ours in Jesus Christ can't be crushed, it can't be destroyed, it can't be overshadowed, it can't be forgotten. And so this morning, God, we lift our voice and we sing to you, 2080, all I need is you. All I need is you, Jesus. All I need is you. You are the source of all I need. And all I need is you. Gosh, this is a big song, church. Because verse 2 says, God, you're all I want. That is a huge statement. You alone, God, is everything I need, and you're everything I want. So as we sing this this morning, it's not simply an invitation to sing a song. It's the prayer of our hearts. God, we want you this morning. We need you this morning. We don't need anything else. We don't want anything else. Because you see, God, all of our hope is you. Can you sing that with me this morning? In full sincerity, God, you're everything I need and you're everything I want. Let's sing it together as a prayer of our heart. All I need is you, Jesus. All I need is you, Jesus. All I need, Jesus. All I need is you. You are the source. You're all I want. All I want is you. You are the source of all I need. And 
all I want is you. All I want. You, O oh Lord, are my only hope. My only hope is you. Lord Jesus, you are my hope. You are my only hope again, church. My only hope is you. Lord, you are our only hope. Lord, our only hope is you. You are the source of all I need. My only this morning we invite that you hear the praise of our heart lord the declaration of our mouth is that god we need you god we don't need anything else this world can provide and god we want you we don't want anything else this world offers for you see god in that declaration we understand that you are our only hope father god we praise you we worship you this morning. We need you, God. We want you, God. Our hope is you. Father God, we pray for a fresh move of your Holy Spirit. God, you're not asleep. Your Holy Spirit hasn't, hasn't vacated the premises. You haven't left us. You haven't abandoned us, Lord. But we've forgotten. We've been disinterested. Our hearts, God, have been pursuing other things. Our minds are full of other stuff. But God, this morning as we assemble ourselves in this space, the desire of our heart is to profess that we need you. We want you. And you, God, are our only hope. Satisfy us today, your people, God. Satisfy us and overwhelm us, God. Transform us is our prayer. We love you and we praise you, God. I love you and I praise you. In the name of the one who died and rose for our sake, who we need, who we want, and our only hope, Jesus Christ, we pray. In church this morning, if you mean it, let me hear you say amen. Amen. Do you believe that God is good? Do you believe that God is what we need? And God is who we want? And God is our only hope? If so, you may be seated. Good morning. I'm Pam Anderson, the pastor of Congregational Care here at Beulah, and I'll now lead us in the prayers of the people. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we come before you joyous and so thankful the many ways that you continue to bless us every day in our lives. And now we offer ourselves in prayer for our friends and our church family and our community on this beautiful Sunday. God, we pray, we pray for the Sawyers family and send prayers of peace and comfort for Gary and the family and friends of Carolyn Sawyers as she joined with the Lord June 7th. We also offer condolences for the family of Joan Travoli as she joined with the Lord June 6, and to the family of Weldon Hazelwood, as he joined with the Lord June 8th. God, let those families all feel your presence and know we are lifting them in prayers of peace and comfort as they walk through their grief. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers for healing as we lift up Jim Taylor as he continues to recover from his knee surgery, and Jane Barefield as she continues to recover from her surgery. We lift up Diane Kleiss, Rhonda Anderson, with peace and healing and comfort as they continue to heal from their surgeries. God, we lift up Betty Donovan, sister of Nancy Dykes, as she starts chemo and is facing possible surgery. Lord, we send healing prayers to Sandy Lunsford, Rex Hedgepath, 
gay people, Russ and Joan and Martha Payne, as they continue to deal with health concerns. We lift up Jean Henson, come for her upcoming surgery, Lord, and pray over the hands of her surgeons. Almighty and everlasting God, we pray to your fullness, who has revealed thyself and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and lives and reigns in perfect unity and love. Grant that we may always hold firmly and joyfully in this faith and living in praise of thy divine mercy. Hear our prayers as we pray for our friends, families, and communities, and for ourselves with our unspoken needs, as we pray together as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Oh, 
Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Gracious and holy God, faithful and loving God, we lift before you the gifts of hearts and lives and ask that you bless and use these gifts, Lord, to build your kingdom reign. We praise you for your faithfulness and invite by presenting these gifts that you too find us faithful. We lift before you praises of our hearts and lives, Lord. We ask that you use us as your servants. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. God bless you as you're seated. I want to invite Pastor Daniel to head out to Children's Church this morning and any of our children who are here with us. I think Chance is going to head out to help you this morning. And So you all head on out to Children's Church. Thank you, Pastor Daniel. I want to give God praise and bear witness to uh, what an incredible church staff we have, uh, pastoral team and staff team. Uh, I was not made aware that I was sick or wasn't aware that I was sick until late in the week. And uh, our pastoral team was on call, ready and available uh, and prepared to step in last Sunday morning and did so without a catch. So I'm thankful for Daniel and for Pastor Pam. I'm thankful for our, our staff, Suzanne and the others in the sound booth, everybody who volunteered to help make that possible. Um, I've been in pastoral ministry for about 28 years, and I can't say that I've always had the security to know that I could be sick and that everything's going to be okay. So I'm thankful for uh, incredible uh, people that God has surrounded me with. Isn't that good to know? God indeed is good. As we gather for worship this morning, it is with uh, grateful hearts that we gather. It also is with sorrow-filled hearts that we gather this morning. Uh, and this week, we note that three of our church family members have been promoted to glory. Uh, Joan Travoli, Carolyn Sawyers, and Weldon Hazelwood. Uh, I wanted to share briefly uh, a testimony about each of those individual people before we begin our sermon this morning. Uh, Joan Travoli, uh, if you know Joan, you know well that she was someone who had a heart full of constant joy. Uh, Joan was a joyful person. And Joan's lifelong pursuit would be the day that we announced in church that she was promoted to glory. That was her joy. Every time I would see her, she would say, Pastor Don, I'm ready to go to heaven. I am ready to be with Jesus. I want to go. 
Someone made comment of Joan this week after hearing that she passed. I was in the church office on Thursday, and this person said, unprompted by me, this is exactly the day that Joan was living for. Bearing faithful witness, Joan Travoli. Carolyn Sawyers. As we know, Carolyn was declining in her health over the past few months. But what was constant for Carolyn and what was, is most remembered by me for Carolyn Sawyers is that Carolyn would say, Pastor Don, God is good in reference to me saying, isn't God good? And she'd say, God is good, but God's better than that. God is fabulous. God's not good. God is fabulous. How wonderful that we can live our lives and announce to the world around us that God is fabulous. Carolyn was the greeter of all greeters. She loved to represent this church and to share a smile with any new person. Carolyn served on the staff pastor parish committee when I was welcomed to be the senior pastor of this church. She met me at the door. Christy and I walked up the sidewalk with the district superintendent, and there she was with her Beulah shirt on, and she said, Welcome to Beulah Church. I love Beulah Church, and so you're going to love Beulah Church too. And I do love Beulah Church. Wells and Hazelwood. I didn't know Weldon and Hazelwood. I was told uh, in the latter months of his wife's life, Brenda, that they had formerly attended Beulah. They were still members of Beulah, but it would be really nice if I reached out to them because he was having a difficult time. Brenda was diagnosed with early onset dementia and Alzheimer's and was declining quickly. And so I went, made contact with Weldon, met with Brenda. She was living in a care facility, got to know her there, met Weldon there, and very soon, very quickly, Brenda passed away. And so then I began to have a relationship, a friendship with Weldon Hazelwood. Got to meet his family at Brenda's memorial service. We were in the midst of building that new digital sign. Sandra Falsman had left the church money for that sign. It was her passion for our church to digitally display the love of God for this community. But we were short just a little bit of money. Tom Owens knows this and those who were serving on that committee. We were short money. Well, then Hazelwood came by the church one afternoon and asked me about that sign. And I said, yeah, we're short a little money. He was gone about an hour. And he came back with a check that covered the full amount of what we owed to pay for that sign. It was a substantial amount of money. No questions asked. No acknowledgement to be made. I want to do this in memory of my wife so that all who know, who pass by this church, know the love and grace of God in this space. It was never mentioned. I was talking to his daughter this week as Weldon was passing away. He was diagnosed on a Thursday, and he died the following Wednesday with a leukemia diagnosis. I told her that story. She never knew that. She never knew that her dad gave a substantial gift in memory of her mom to the church, but she said, that's my dad. That's who I know him to be. So today we celebrate three lives well lived, three men and women who lived faithfully declaring the goodness of God, know the fabulousness of God, and we're going to gather to celebrate their lives. And so I'm praying for you as a church family, for those of you who were dear to any of those three people, You've lost a friend. You've lost a spouse. We continue to pray for Gary. Uh, but we're thankful today that, and we say this at our memorial service, aren't we thankful that this isn't all there is? Our hope is beyond this world. So today we celebrate the life of Joan Travoli, Carolyn Sawyers, and Weldon Hazelwood. And I want to tell you, church, God is fabulous. Amen? Amen. We're one Sunday removed from Pentecost. Last Sunday, we gathered as a church, or you gathered as a church. I did so via Facebook. But we gathered as a church to celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. Our church is still adorned with red, reminding us of the fire of the Holy Spirit. A prophesied gift, a promised gift. The disciples, as we know, were holed up in the upper room where Christ told them to be. A part of that was their obedience. A part of that was their fear of a retaliation of what had just happened to Christ. But they were there, as they were told to be, and they were anticipating a coming of the presence of God that they could not understand, but it would soon be realized. The Holy Spirit comes in great power, so says Acts, just as Jesus said. They were filled immediately with the power of God, and they began to bear witness. 
They begin to testify in the languages of all those gathered in Jerusalem that God is good. God is not just good, they said. God is fabulous. A wonder-working God, a powerful God, a healing God, a loving God, a forgiving God, a redeeming God, a God who understands sacrificial love. And They waited. And just as Christ said it would be, it happened. They celebrated by announcing the goodness of God. I want to encourage you this morning, church, in this journey that is ours from disciples to apostles. I want to recap your memory. A disciple is a student, one who's learning, understanding, growing. The disciples had that time with Christ, and now at the coming of Pentecost, they became apostles. I want to refresh your memory that an apostle is one who is sent. A disciple sits at the feet, listens, learns, grows for the day that they receive the power and the confidence, because that's what happens at Pentecost, power and confidence to bear witness. They became apostles. They were sent. Christ said, when you receive the power, you will be my witness. This morning I want to encourage you to know that as disciples growing to apostleship, we have an obligation to this day of Pentecost. And you may say an obligation. What are we obligated to? We're going to find that out in just a moment. But you have an obligation. When you bear the name of Jesus Christ, there is an obligation. There's a responsibility attached. There's an expectation for your life. And it all finds its basis in the day of Pentecost. I want to read two portions of Scripture for you and with you this morning. If you have your Bible, the Scripture is also found in the bulletin, projected on the screen. Two portions of Scripture. First talks about our confidence. What I want to remind you of this morning, church, is at Pentecost, the disciples who were growing into apostles needed two things. They needed power, and they needed confidence. They needed power from on high, which was promised, and it was coming, and they needed confidence. So what is confidence? I have a portion of Scripture I want to share with you that helps us better understand confidence. And then I'm going to read a portion of Scripture that helps us understand the evidence of our confidence. What is the outpouring of the confidence? What does confidence look like in our life? What is the evidence of that power and confidence? And so that's Galatians from Paul. First Scripture. This is the confidence that we have in our relationship with God. This is the confidence. Here's an example of what that confidence is. If we ask for anything in agreement with God's will, he listens to us. There's a prime example of our confidence in Jesus Christ. If we ask of anything according to God's will, he hears us. The primary part of that portion of Scripture for us this morning is this is the confidence. Second, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. What is the evidence of the power and confidence in our life? But the character of God. What is it the disciples needed in this understanding of being an apostle? They needed power from on high. They needed confidence to be witness. As Christ said, you're going to be my witness. You will be my witness. It wasn't, well, I'll let you think about it a day or two, and I'll get back with you in a week and let you, let you tell me whether you think you want to do it or not. He says, immediately, when you're filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, two things are going to happen. You're going to get some power, and you're going to be confident. Confident for what? Confident to bear the witness that God is who God says God is, and bear witness of the evidence of the character of God in you, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. See why Pentecost is so important, church? What do we need today but power from on high and confidence to be who we are in Jesus Christ? Acts 1.8, you will receive power and you will be my witness. What the disciples needed were power and confidence. Power ensured their confidence to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Confidence is a popular 
word in today's society. How many of you have ever encouraged your children to be confident? Anybody ever encouraged you to be confident? Each of my children, when offered an opportunity to publicly speak in class or present a report, have said to me, Dad, how do you do it every Sunday? I'm so nervous and I'm so scared. It is nerve-wracking to stand before your peers and offer a report. Some of us would probably rather be doing something else because we don't feel like it's our gift. The confidence that we have is not our confidence. The confidence that we have is the confidence given to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were huddled in the upper room not because they didn't have an itinerary for the week and they were just waiting to go do it. They needed power and confidence to be the witnesses that Christ had called them to be. Confidence today in our society is offered to us on every occasion. Be self-confident. Be self-assured. Live brashly and boldly and brazenly. And the theme of our society and culture today is often self-confidence. You've got to have self-confidence. What Pentecost reminds us of is this. It's not about self-confidence. It's about God-based confidence. As a Christian, as one who's going to bear witness, as a person growing from a disciple, a student, to an apostle, one who is sent, it can't be only about self-confidence. It has to be the confidence that is yours and the power to bear evidence of the character of God. The word confidence is used 54 times in the King James Version of the Bible and 60 times in the NIV Version of the Bible. The Bible says that there are some things we should not have confidence in, church. For example, have no confidence in your flesh, Philippians 3.3. 3. Paul wrote these words to counter the claim for those who thought that they were accepted by God based on who they were. I am a Jew, so God has accepted me. I have confidence in my Judaism. I have confidence in my training. I have a master's degree from a qualified seminary, so hey, that's all I need. I'm confident. I have religious devotion. I pray multiple times a day and read the Word of God. Paul says, it ain't so, church. That's not confidence. That's confidence in the flesh. God is no respecter of person, says Acts 10. Proverbs 14, 16 says that a righteous man and woman departs from evil, but a fool rages in his own confidence. A fool rages in his own confidence. In other words, to arrogantly assume that sin has no con consequence in our lives is a foolish confidence. If we say sin has no consequence... It's a foolish confidence. There are consequences to sin. If we revel in our own flesh and our own self-confidence self and dependence, Paul says we fall short. The power that is ours from the Holy Spirit gives us a confidence that is ours only found in Jesus Christ. If we're going to be confident in something, says Psalm 118, 8 and 9, here's what it should be. Trust in the Lord and put no confidence in man. Trust in the Lord and the Lord alone and put no confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord your God than to put confidence in any king or prince. Those who trust government, those who trust finances, those who trust other people or themselves, church, will be disappointed. If you place your confidence in the financial well-being of the world around us, guess what? You're going to be disappointed. If you place the whole of your confidence in any political party or person, guess what, church? You're going to be disappointed. If you place your full confidence in your 401K and all your finances, guess what? You're going to be disappointed. But those, Romans 10 and 11, those who place their full confidence in God will never be ashamed, will never be disappointed. Our confidence comes as Christians from our relationship 
our intimate relationship with Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. He is our high priest. The power we need, the grace we need, says Hebrews 4.16, comes from the power and the equipping of the Holy Spirit. Power to be what? Witnesses. Witnesses of what? The character of God. What is the evidence of confidence in our lives? Paul says the evidence of confidence in your life is that you bear witness of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the evidence of your confidence in Christ. I want to ask you this morning, church, how's your confidence? Is it a self-confidence, a self-reliance, a self-dependence, or is it a confidence that comes from the power of the Holy Spirit? Disciples needed two things. They needed power from on high, and they needed confidence. And when the Holy Spirit came, it was evident that they had both. How do we know they had both? The Word of God tells us they immediately began to announce the good news of God. God is good, and God is great, and God is fabulous. And this person you've crucified, his son, Jesus Christ, is our Savior. And in that, we're confident. So you know what you can do? You can burn us, you can stone us, you can hang us on a cross, and it don't matter because our confidence is in Jesus Christ. You know what the church needs today, church? We need power from on high, and we need confidence to bear witness of Jesus Christ. Christ says, you will be my witness. I want to ask you this morning how it is you're doing in your witnessing for Jesus Christ. How is it that you're doing in your witnessing for Jesus Christ? How is it that you're bearing out the character of God in all aspects of your life, of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, selflessness, faithfulness, and control of the flesh? That's the evidence. Anybody ever had to bear witness to an occasion, a car accident? You're called as the primary witness to an occasion or an event, and you saw it firsthand. I saw it. I was there. This person is at fault. This person is not at fault. You are the chief witness. You're bearing witness to what it is you know. The Christian life that moves from discipleship to apostleship is obligated. I want you to hold that word, church. We are obligated to bear witness to what it is we know personally. Do we know the resurrected Jesus Christ personally? Do we know the power of the Holy Spirit personally? Are we infused and endued daily with the character of God personally that we can bear evidence to our relationship with God? Is there love that is an unconditional love, that a love that is not provoked to anger? Is there a love that demonstrates that we have first been loved by God and this is how we do it? Is there a peace that passes all understanding that this world cannot afford? Is there a joy that comes from a deep and abiding relationship with God regardless of our circumstances? Happiness is based on the conditions of our circumstances. Joy is an inner relationship, evidence of an inner relationship with the living and abiding God. Joy, church. Patience. We laugh about patience. Whoo, we don't got any patience. Patience is evidence of a power-filled, confident relationship. Not in self, not in control of self, but in the person of Jesus Christ. Goodness and kindness. All characters of God, all evidence of a relationship, an intimate relationship, power and confidence. Self-control. The flesh. How does the power of the Holy Spirit in you on a daily basis control the flesh? That's the prayer more of you, God, and less of me. More of you, God, and less of me. Get me out of the way, Lord, and you be and do what you need to be and do. 
And if you choose to use me, I'll be honored. And if you don't, I'm good with that too. Pentecost was a prophesied fulfillment of the Word of God. It is the reality of the power of God breaking into the created world where disciples become apostles, where those who cowered away in the upper room now had both power and confidence to stand and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ, an evidence-based eyewitness report. What was the base of the evidence? What was the basis of the evidence? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. That's how we bear witness to Jesus Christ. For you see, it's difficult. For many of us, we immediately begin to think that bearing witness means we preach a sermon. Bearing witness means we go to a local neighbor and we take the gospel and we just shove it on them. We just push it. Bearing witness, according to the Word of God, is that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, yield yourself daily to the work of God in you that you begin to grow in and bear the character of God. How you love, how you seek peace, how you find joy, how you're patient, how you're good, you're kind, you're gentle, you're loving. In the face face of an enemy who slaps you, you turn the other cheek. And an opportunity to criticize and be little, you encourage. When the flesh is weak, we cry out, Holy Spirit, fill me today that I'll make the best choice that honors you with this human body. Is this the best choice this human body can make confidently in you, Lord? That's self-control. Christ knew that those disciples could not be apostles until they waited, and they received power and confidence, and then they bore witness. I want to ask you all this morning, what's your power grid look like? How do you find confidence? What are the evidence of apostleship in your life? I used a word early on about it being our obligation. Our obligation. Now, when I read this portion of Scripture this week, I said to myself, ouch. Because, you know, I don't often think of my relationship with God, the power of the Holy Spirit in me, the confidence that is mine in Jesus Christ, and the evidence of that relationship being an obligation. But if you bear the name Christ, Christian, if you announce in any portion or particular part of your life that you are a follower of Jesus Christ, there's an obligation. Romans 8, therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be your sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Those who live according to the fl- Spirit, oh, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. What's your heart's desire today, church? The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life, abundant life right now and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh can never please God. If you're pursuing to please God today but living in the realm of the flesh, it is impossible. There's got to be a submission of yourself to the authority of Jesus Christ, a filling of the Holy Spirit, a power from on high, and a confidence for you to bear the character of God. 
You, however, are not in this realm, the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Holy Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives you life. And if the Spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is living in you, he raised you as well as your body to give life to your mortal body because of the Spirit. Here goes, search. Here's the word. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. We have an obligation. It's not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live according to the Spirit, the Spirit will put to death the misdeeds of your body and you will live. We have an obligation. What's our obligation? To pursue power from on high. What's our obligation? To be filled with the confidence to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. What is the evidence of that witness being born in us? love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness. And church, the world can't give you any of that. The world can't give you any of that. And Paul says, you're obligated. If you hear this message today, you're obligated. If you bear the name of Christ, you're obligated. If you want to be pursuant of what it means to be an apostle, you're obligated. Why are you obligated? Because God has done it all for you already. God's done it. He needs us to be witnesses now to what it is he's done. The disciples waited, and from on high they were filled with power. Power for what? To be a witness. And in them was born the character of God. And apostles they became. They were sent. Christ said in that moment when the power of the Holy Spirit fills you, church, you can't sit down. You're going to go. You're going to go and you're going to tell and you're going to love and you're going to spread peace and joy and kindness and goodness. You're going to be long-suffering and patient and you're going to die to the flesh and you're going to live in the Spirit. That's the gift of Pentecost. I want to ask you this morning what your confidence level is. What's the evidence in your life look like? What kind of love are you sharing? What kind of joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness? Do you live in the realm of the flesh where it's all about you? Me, me, my, my, I, I? Or do you live in the realm of the Spirit where it's others first? You know what joy means, don't you? Jesus, others, yourself. Jesus first, others, and then yourself. That's true joy. Jesus knew those disciples were going to need some power. They couldn't bear witness. He said, you better wait right here because you're not going to be able to do what you've got to do until you get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit filled them to overflow. They were confident, and they preached the good news. Church, the world is waiting for confident apostles of Jesus Christ. The world's waiting for confident apostles, those who would be sent Perhaps this morning you're gauging your barometer of what the power looks like in your life. And maybe your power grid has a disconnect. Maybe often you're operating out of the flesh. You're just doing out of the willpower of your own heart. I can do this. I'll do this Christian life. I'll pray. I'll do it. I'll go. But there's no joy in that. There's a disconnect in your power grid. Or maybe your confidence is only self-confidence, meaning you do it but you want the kudos for it, right? See me, hear me, know me, I'm important. And the world tells you that's okay. Or maybe this morning you have power and you have confidence, but you don't really know how the evidence is working out. And God, I want evidence in my life. Because you see, I'm obligated. I I accept the obligation of faithfulness. And I want it to be lived out in my life. This is the summation of Pentecost. There is an obligation. 
Oh, and God has done so much for me. I can never do enough. Say enough, share enough, love enough. God, it's minute compared to the power and the confidence. Church, this morning we want to be apostles. Sent. Power-filled, confident. Evidence-based apostles. That's who I want to be. And if you want to join me in that pursuit, I want to pray for you this morning. If that's the pursuit of your heart and life on this post-Pentecost Sunday morning, because it sets the stage for the rest of the days of who you are. If that's who you want to be, I want to join you in praying for you. Because that's who I want to be. Gracious God, we come before you this morning. We are overwhelmed by your power, by your presence, God, by your word, by your Holy Spirit in us and among us this morning, God. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you this morning that you remind us that it wasn't just a one-time event in the history of the church that you came in power, but it is a daily opportunity, Lord. This morning as we come before you, we acknowledge that for some of us, Lord, we aren't even aware that there's a power grid available to us. We haven't tapped that resource. We've heard about it, but we don't know about it. We don't live in it. We don't understand it. And for this morning, it may be the first realization to step toward that power grid and be plugged in. For some of us this morning, we have the power grid, but its ampage is not at full throttle. We're distracted. We're discouraged. We're disappointed. For some of us this morning, we have confidence, but it's self-confidence. It's about us. And God, we humbly come before you and ask that you forgive. Lord, for some of us, we have fruit, but it's at time bruised and never taken out of the package to be enjoyed. God, this morning, in all these areas of our life, we pursue you. We want ampage. We want full power. God, we want confidence in your character, and we want evidence-based living of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, not something we just hear about once a year on Pentecost Sunday, but a daily experience of bearing witness. This morning, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, I would invite you to just simply where you are, raise your hand. I want to see you. God, this morning you see the hands of your people who are seeking prayer for power, for confidence, Lord, to be those who have evidence-based living. Yes, Lord, thank you for the multitudes of hands. God, it's not important that we stand before you. It's not important that we be acknowledged before the congregation because you know the deep chambers of the hearts of the ones you've created, every man, woman, and child in this room. You see the heart's desire, Lord, as they've raised their hand to say before you, I want to be fully engaged I want to be power-filled. I want to be an overcomer. I want to be present and accounted for. I want to have confidence, and I want to, be, I want to have a life that's evidenced by the faith that I say I have, but, Lord, in how I live my life. I want to bear witness as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Lord, we cover this church in your power this day. We invite your Holy Spirit to fully cover from concrete floor to ceiling rafter from window to window, from beam to beam, Lord, your Holy Spirit fully engulfing this place and every person. I pray that as we leave this place, that we would leave this place with a full assurance and understanding of your power, of our confidence in you, Lord, and the character that you are growing in us. We pursue it today, Christ. We thank you. Now, God, be at work in us and be at work through us. We pray, Lord, that you be at work through us in the life of this church and in this community. We thank you and we praise you for power. We praise you for confidence and we praise you for the fruit of the Spirit this day, Lord. We love you. I love you, Lord, with the whole of my heart and of my life and I praise you and I thank you, Jesus. And we ask our prayer now in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord who reigns now and forever. And let the church say amen. Amen. Is God good? Is God fabulous? I invite you to stand with me, church.
We're going to lift our voice in our closing song. Blessed Assurance 369. Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, now washed in His blood. Whose story is it? This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Let's lift our voices, church. 369, the words also found on the screen to your left and right. Let's let Hopkins Road know that we have a blessed assurance this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's sing. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. Perfect submission. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my side, angels descending, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my story. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect condition. All is at rest. I and my Savior. Watching and waiting, looking, filled with His goodness, filled with His goodness. Uh, are we saying, church, this is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Amen. God, we do praise you. To the one now who is able to protect you all, every single child of God from falling, to present you blameless and rejoicing before His glorious presence, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, belong glory, majesty, power, and authority before all time, now, and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace, church.